Good evening. And let me start with a relatively brief overview and then we'll move to a Q&A. So I'll start by looking at what was the shape of the economy uh, when the war broke up. And I would say generally that it was quite good. If we look at the growth of the Israeli economy coming out of the COVID-19, we might have forgotten, but that was the last crisis. Uh, we actually came out remarkably well with very high growth in uh, 2021, 2022, uh, 8.5, 6.4, much higher than uh, other economies. And also when you look at the extent of damage to the economy during the crisis, it was milder than uh, in uh, most other economies. And when we look, uh, we have to remember that our population grows much faster than that of other uh, countries. So when we compare these numbers, uh, they sort of uh, uh, overplay <laughs> the, the uh, relative growth of Israel uh, to other countries. But when we look at GDP per capita, which already takes into account the growth of population, uh, we can see that actually follow after the drop uh, during the COVID-19 crisis, we came and growth actually brought us to a level of per capita income, which is basically the level, you know, the level of our uh, standard of living in some way, which is higher than the trend, the long-term trend before that. So the recovery was re really remarkable. Uh, another look at the economy <laughs> prior to the war is how did the uh, labor market perform? And what you can see again, looking just before the war at the level of unemployment, it was at the lowest point since many, many years after uh, what now looks like a relatively small peak during COVID. And what is not less important is that the employment rate, which basically shows what share of the population is actually employed. The blue line, and you can see also that it's higher than it was pre-COVID and it's on an a, a upward trend since uh, many, many years. So labor market was strong, high employment, uh, wages have also been growing up. And generally, another uh, um, indication that the economy was in a very good shape. Inflation was a problem. Everybody was talking about inflation. Uh, you know, as somebody and most of you, I think, know that uh, three or five percent inflation is not a, you know, it's not the kind of inflation that we lived in uh, with uh, in the 80s. But still, it was definitely a, an issue and it uh, necessitated tightening a monetary policy. But here again, if you look at Israel comparing to other countries, the increase in uh, inflation was much milder. And we also have seen already the response of the uh, inflation to the tightening of monetary policy. And it's sort of on its way back to where it should be, which is between 1 and 3% according to inflation target. So overall, the economy was in good shape. And it's important to note that it's not just that in that particular time, the economy was in good shape. But there are some uh, attributes of the economy which, uh, which help the resilience of the economy when we, look at, when we look at its ability to withstand shocks. And I would say the main elements of, uh, that help the resilience of the economy are the fact that we have a relatively low uh, public debt, public debt to GDP. Uh, I guess 10 or 15 years ago, 60% of GDP may have not have sounded so low, but in the last 10 or 15 years, the debt of other countries, including European countries, went up quite a bit. And in relative terms, that's definitely a comfortable place to be in. We have a current account surplus. We have a surplus of assets over liabilities in our uh, foreign in our foreign exchange. Uh, the Bank of Israel has very high reserves. 
And we have a very dynamic uh, high-tech sector, which contributed something like 40% to the growth of the economy over the last five years. We have a stable financial uh, system, very well-capitalized banks, uh, and strong institutions, although there was some uh, some issue about the uh, strengths of institutions uh, before the war, you know, with the judicial uh, overall. Now, this um, attributes that make the Israeli economy resilient actually were reflected in the fact that we, we uh, faced many shocks, but we faced them and managed to, to deal with them quite well, and that's true regarding the global financial crisis where the economy was relatively with a small damage and very rapid recovery, certainly in comparison to other countries, strong recovery from the COVID crisis and a quite rapid recovery from a previous world, a, a previous rounds of violence or, a, or wars, I'm hesitant to call them wars. There was the Lebanon war and then there were all these rounds of violence uh, with Gaza, but the economy bounced back quite rapidly. And it's important to note when we think, to, to think about that when we think uh, sort of forward. So then the war broke and uh, we can start by looking at some early indicators to how the economy was affected as a result of the war. One area to look at is obviously how the uh, stock exchange performs relative to, uh, to the stock exchange in other, uh, in other economies. And as you well know, over the, a long period of time, there is quite high correlation between the performance of our uh, markets and the performance of uh, the U.S. markets, for example. So this relatively high correlation uh, actually started breaking uh, to some extent already before uh, the war, act actually in the beginning of 2023, with mm -hmm. the concerns about the judicial overall. But then uh, when we look at the uh, Actually, in uh, October of 23, you can see yet another decline relative to the trend in other uh, indices. Since November, <coughs> actually, there was some recovery, but the gap in terms of performance remains. So uh, the, in terms of the trend, it started recovery, but we're still lagging behind quite significantly uh, relative to uh, to the stock markets in uh, in other advanced economies, another uh, factor that we look at uh, when we think about and those are sort of uh, daily uh, da daily indices, so you can actually see the short term effect of the mm -hmm. developments is an indicator of private investment, and that's the credit card purchases. What you can see is a sharp decline. These are daily, uh, daily uh, data, and they're very uh, uh, volatile, uh, partly because of uh, uh, seasonality. So it, they're, they're volatile because of that. Here were, uh, there was a period of uh, um, holidays. So, but still, when you look, when you take the long-term average of about 100 prior to the war, you can see a decline of about 25% in the first two weeks, but then bouncing back, uh, the credit card purchases bounced back. Now that's true for the overall, but there are uh, significant uh, differences between the different sectors. So in uh, most sectors, actually, they, uh, they bounced back uh, to, to the level the pre-war level, but there are some areas, and I wrote it to myself, such as flights, car rentals, holiday, uh, hotelery, that are still far below uh, the level uh, prior to the uh, That's to the war. Where you can only book a lot. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I think I'm not sure it's the only reason. I think there is the desire to travel around is has also uh, 
has been diminished, yeah. Here, what you see is actually the results of a survey that was conducted by the Central Bureau of Statistics. And the question that was posed to companies was how badly your company's turnover was damaged uh, in November compared to what it was uh, in the same period uh, in ordinary times. The red bars are the ones that the proportion of of uh, businesses that said that the decline was somewhere between 75, between 51 and, and the 100. Actually, the red is 76 and over. And then the green uh, represent no harm. And uh, as uh, one may expect, uh, in food and drink services, there was a relatively uh, sh uh, large portion of the companies that reported high uh, decline. <coughs> Uh, in construction, obviously, uh, but high tech, the high tech was less uh, affected by the war. I should say that this is November. In some areas, especially in food and drink services, there was since then already some recovery that we've seen in some other, uh, in some other data. Another question that was posed to these companies was, what are the main constraints to the activity of your business? Is it more a decline in the demand for your goods or services? Or is it more uh, a problem of supply, mostly of labor? And what you can see in construction, for example, right. as we all know, a very big chunk of the industry is basically paralyzed because of lack of Palestinian workers and foreign workers. They're very dependent on that. In high tech sector, about half of the companies were not harmed, but still they have quite a large uh, proportion of, uh, of people on reserve that have uh, that are not working. Again, we're talking about November. I think it's changing now. There is the uh, number of reservists that are being uh, released is uh, now uh, growing. In trade, for example, it's about about half of the companies were affected, but it's mostly due to lack of demand. So we, we see that the, uh, the story is very different in, dif in different sectors. What is the shape of the labor market? Here we can see October and November, and the data, the way the Bureau of Statistics measures unemployment is the, the standard way is asking have you uh, been seeking work in the last four weeks? That's the uh, uh, and 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 that's how uh, uh, unemployed are counted. However, uh, during uh, periods like this one, and also in the during COVID, the uh, definition of unemployment was expanded to include people who were not working due to economic reasons. Some of them are. On um, unemployed are getting unemployment benefit. It, it was called here halat. I'm not sure. It's a paid uh, vacation or paid leave, um, which is also now being used. The same system is being used, and so when we add people that were uh, unemployed by the standard definition, but also absent for economic reasons. Uh, the unemployment rate actually shoots shot up to almost 10% in October and declined in November to 8.5%, still a very high number. If you add to that people who are out of work, uh, n not for economic reasons, but for other reasons, uh, which includes uh, people that are on military service, I mean reservists, these are uh, these bars, and absent for other reasons, for example, if um, the husband is on a, a military service and uh, the mother of three kids cannot go to work, they would be counted here. So if we look, take all these people together, we get in October almost 20%, 20% actually of employees were not employed. Uh, 
that other reason had declined quite sharply in November because, the, for example, the uh, educational system is back in full uh, work. So what we see here is one, unemployment is still high if you take into account all those who are unemployed due to, uh, to economic reasons. But the additional uh, people who are out of work are already back at work, except for the reservists. So the, the picture here is of a recovery of employment, but not, not, full of recover, uh, not full recovery. So this is the picture when we sort of look at uh, data, which are high frequency data up until now. And the question is, where are we heading? And I should start by saying, it depends, <laughs> and the uncertainty is very high. If we look at a previous rounds of violence, generally, we could be quite optimistic. If I take, for example, the second Lebanon war, you can see a decline in one quarter. That's the last quarter of 2006, but a full recovery the following quarter. The same is true when we look at some, um, for example, uh, all these names of the rounds of violence. I'm not sure that the uh, uh, English translation tells you much, but anyway, Operation Pillar of Defense. Amut Anan, maybe, I'm not sure. Um, a, a relatively modest decline and full recovery uh, after that. The same with uh, Operation Protective Edge which you, there was not even a decline uh, of activity in one quarter. Some of these um, rounds of violence actually coincided with other uh, shocks. For example, the Operation Guardian of the Walls, Shomer Homot, thank you, uh, came to, uh, during COVID. So it's very high, uh, hard to sort of uh, um, identify the effect of that. And here, the, the dominant effect was uh, COVID. The one period that is very different is the second intifada. Here, the second intifada in the early 2000s actually came after uh, uh, the burst of the uh, dot-com uh, bubble. And there was a general uh, slowdown in the global economy, but there was also a very a long period of uh, violence, of terrorist attacks, uh, reduced uh, confidence, personal confidence. And, uh, and there were also, I would say, significant policy mistakes. And I think what we see here, a very long period of uh, a, actually a um, recession, were the result of all of these things, including policy that I would say would far, was far from optimal. Uh, uh, one element of that was that when the uh, intifada broke up, our debt to GDP ratio was quite high. There were some policy mistakes also on the monetary front. And uh, that resulted actually in, as a result of the recession, the uh, um, budget deficit actually grew quite sharply. And that resulted in a very uh, sharp rise in the interest rate on public debt, which necessitated or forced the government to actually to reduce or cut its spending quite sharply during the recession, which actually made the recession worse. I'm mentioning that because I have, I, I think it's an important, um, and it's an important uh, uh, event to study in order not to repeat the same uh, during the current uh, uh, crisis that we're living in. So when we, Looking at the experience uh, from previous rounds of violence and looking at the relative resilience of the economy, based on that, various, uh, uh, various players are making projections. So these are the projections of the OECD. Now, I should say that 
beside the uh, fact that we're experiencing war, there is also a slowdown in the global economy. So, uh, and, and, and that still has an effect on, on uh, our economy. And what you can see here is the projections for 24 and uh, for the year 24 and 25 by the OECD. Now, just uh, uh, when we look at, I mean, what they're projecting is a growth rate of 1.5% for this year. I should say 1.5% for Israel is very low growth because our population grows by some 2% a year. So that means a, a decline in, a, in per capita uh, income. And they uh, project a recovery the following year. I should say that generally we've seen it also in the previous rounds. It, when the economy, when, when the crisis is relatively short, usually it means that the uh, productive capacity uh, is there, and when the uh, when the shock sort of is uh, is gone, I'm not sure that's the right. How do you say? Dissipates. Dissipates. Thank you. Um, the productive capacity is being uh, utilized, and then we see generally a strong recovery. So that's what is expected uh, according to the uh, OECD. And when we look at different projections by different players, we see what we generally see. I'm, I'm focusing on the year 2024. We see very wide range of projections. And that's very much related to the assumptions underlying these projections, uh, where Moody's, for example, are projecting a decline of 1.4%, which means actually a decline of about 3.5% in per capita GDP. It's a quite a severe decline. And uh, um, the Bank of Israel and the Ministry of Finance, in their basic sen scenarios, are expecting somewhere between 1.5 and 2% growth. So this is sort of the, the uh, these, this is the range, and these are the projections. And I think most of the main projections assume that the intense part of the fighting is ending more or less now, and that we're actually moving into a somewhat less intensive um, fighting uh, in, in this quarter. And they all don't assume that the Northern Front will actually uh, escalate into a full-fledged war. And that, that's important to note because I think that uh, if we, uh, I mean, all these assumptions that actually we will start seeing a relatively rapid recovery in 25 are based on that. Uh, if things escalate also in the North, we're in a, in a different story. Uh, what can we say about uh, macroeconomic policy? So I just uh, have here a list of the steps taken by the Bank of Israel in order to uh, sort of uh, alleviate problems faced by individuals and by small businesses as a result of the war. Um, they took some steps in the foreign exchange market. I may talk about it later, but you probably uh, sort of know the basic steps. And also, uh, they took steps in order to make sure that there is no shortage of liquidity, both in shekels and in foreign exchange. And there was a large uh, number of steps taken in order to mitigate the, uh, the problems faced uh, in terms of the ability to repay uh, credit by, uh, by victims, by those who were evacuated, by those in the, uh, in, the air, in the north and in the south, and by those who are on reserve duty. I have to say that here the experience uh, during uh, COVID actually uh, was, uh, I would say, expanded the toolkit that is available. 
to uh, central banks in general and also to the to the Bank of Israel, and they basically used all these uh, tools that are in the toolkit. In terms of government finances, uh, what is expected by the Ministry of Finance is a very sharp increase in spending, almost fifty billion dollars uh, shekels. Sorry and the expected decline in revenues relative to what was planned for the 24 uh, budget before of almost the same order of magnitude, which may basically increases the uh, expected debt uh, by 96 billion shekels. And that means that the government uh, deficit is going to be almost 6% of GDP. That's a very large increase in the deficit. And the question is whether the government will be able and willing to change the priorities in the budget in a way that will make sure that we don't move about above this level. And so far, it's not clear. We've seen a large uh, significant discussions regarding uh, the willingness of the <coughs> government to actually cut spending on issues that are not related to the war. I think it's important not because the, not only because the order of magnitude of this deficit puts us in, I would say, a dangerous zone in terms of the market, but I think the markets will also look uh, at whether the uh, government is actually <coughs> managing to control it fi its finances uh, du during this challenging uh, time. So I think it's, it's not only the size, but it's also the message behind it. In any case, the debt to GDP ratio is expected to rise uh, to about 67, according to different, uh, different uh, uh, analysts around 66 or 67 percent, which means that eventually the government will have to deal with it. Uh, I'm not sure what we experienced during COVID, this 8.5 and 6.4 percent of growth, which actually brought the debt to GDP ratio right back to where it was before COVID. Uh, I'm not, I don't think we will experience the same um, a situation now, and I think one of the big worries is also the expected longer term rise in uh, defense uh, expenditures, which will make it harder to actually bring uh, debt back to sort of levels that are more comfortable. Now, it's important to have a debt to GDP ratio which is comfortable because it means that you can react to shocks and unfortunately we are prone to shocks. So it's just a small summary. Uh, basically we entered this crisis with an economy which is not only in good shape but also which demonstrated its resilience and there are very specific uh, elements that uh, are contributing to this resilience. Uh, but the, the question of what will be the duration of the, uh, of the war, the intensity, whether it's one front or another front sort of uh, will very much determine the extent of the decline of the economy and the, fisc the necessity for, uh, for uh, um, increasing spending. Uh, the, I think the, the big uh, test to the government is whether its uh, ability to actually change the priorities uh, of the budget and the, its ability to really uh, channel resources to what is needed as a result of the war and being able to actually cut what is not needed. And it's, there is a very important point here. I think if the government is able to actually provide the support, for example, to small businesses and give them this bridge over the period when they are not able to, we're not, they're not earning, and they will be there at the end of the war, that means that they will get back to operate and that will support the recovery. 
if government fails to give them that support, they will not be there and the recovery will be much smaller because to build a new business from scratch is, takes a lot of time and resources. And maybe the last point is because of the uncertainty regarding the duration of the war and the extent, the extent of the needs for fiscal support for the war and for the war-related issues, the government needs to be very prudent in what it does at this stage. And that, again, calls for a very, I would say, very um, serious change of priorities to, to leave room to continue doing what is necessary if uh, things deteriorate. I think I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Fug. I um, had a few questions that um, we were discussing earlier that we thought would be appropriate to kick off a Q&A session with, and then if we've got some time at the end, perhaps we'll uh, open up to the floor. Um, I'm sure everyone in there at various times has pulled out a banknote and given it across to someone in a restaurant or a shop or wherever they are, one of their kids, hopefully not trying to check with it's one of their kids. But I wanted to ask uh, Professor Flo, because it's my first question and it's a lighter one to start with. The first time you handed over a shekel note with your signature on it. <laughs> um, Did you notice it was your signature? Oh, your yeah, business? yeah. Actually, it's the only tangible thing that I could tell some people about what I do. What do you do as a governor? I sign <laughs> the banknotes. So, actually, what I decided to do was to uh, go to my favorite uh, place in the Shuk. That sells uh, that sells uh, greenery. How do you say green greens like yeah, parsley and so on? Oh. And, and uh, this is one I, I like to go to the Machne Yehuda Shuk, mm -hmm. and so I decided that that's where I will launch the new series of, uh, <laughs> and that's what I did. And actually, it was a very popular little video clip. <laughs> so. <laughs> Recently, the Bank of Israel um, cut interest rates. Um, you've already talked about inflation being on the way down. <coughs> How do you see the glide path for interest rates in 2024 and beyond here in Israel? Well, one thing that I uh, I will not do is will not I'll not give you a number. I can tell you what the market says. I can tell you what the Bank of Israel says. You probably know that, but I did bring the numbers. Uh, but I think that I would say generally, the macroeconomic uh, developments that are, I would say, the main uh, scenario are supporting a further uh, decline in inflation, which will allow the bank to continue reducing interest rates at a very, I'm sure they will be very gradual. Now, the main issue that can sort of uh, uh, interfere with this process is if the shekel sort of starts depreciating very rapidly again. I think what helped them take the uh, decision that was sort of half expected by the market was besides seeing that the inflation is actually moving uh, towards its uh, target, uh, they all, there was also the appreciation of the shekel uh, in the last, uh, I don't know, six weeks or so. And that also indicated that one of the sources of concern about inflation is the depreciation. Once that was out, I think that sort of is the ability to, to take that decision. I can say that the, in the last government, in the last, sorry, last uh, Bank of Israel decision, they're talking about interest rate being between 3.75 and 4% by the end of this year. But, you know, things change. It's not a commitment, it's just a projection. Um, obviously, the shekels are a, a corollary of that, or an influence on that. And you mentioned that, but you know, the shekels plummeted when the war began, um, having had a difficult 2023 already. Touched, I think, were, um, less than 4.1 on the dollar, heading to five to the pound, which the Brits haven't seen for, <laughs> before I had any grey hair <laughs> that long ago. Um, 
Do you think the, the shekel could continue its upward march? Because the factors that pulled it up in the past largely remain intact. The growth of um, domestic savings that are invested overseas and need to be hedged back. The move from imported energy to our own energy self-sufficiency. And just the strong growth of the, the tech sector. So do you think they could reignite a continued bull run in the shekel? Uh, well, I think the, it's a, the big question. The fundamentals are what you mentioned. And if uh, the war is relatively short, and if we are on a recovery path, I think there, uh, there are forces, the fundamentals that support the shekel. And I mentioned the current account uh, surplus, and you know, if the tech sector and the defense industry that is now also uh, in, enjoying a boom, I'm not sure it's the right word, but I mean, both enjoying and boom. <laughs> uh, but uh, so I think that uh, these are uh, elements that support the strength of the shekel. However, uncertainty and concerns and uh, worry about uh, what's going to happen in the world. There are shorter term uh, effects that also may have an effect. I should mention two things that actually we've seen this very sharp strengthening of the shekel after the initial reaction. So I think one uh, element, although the, the exchange rate didn't react to it immediately, was the announcement of the bank, of the uh, uh, central bank, that it is willing to sell up to $30 billion uh, if necessary. We saw that it was necessary only at the very beginning. It also announced that it's willing to inject $15 billion of dollars in liquidity which was, I think, so I think that sort of was at the background. And then there was the weakening of the dollar, which also contributed. And one last element, which we've seen for a very long time, and then during the period of the uh, concern about the judicial overall, it seemed to not have an effect, but I think its effect is back, is the relationship between the exchange rate and what's happening in the stock market in the US. Uh, as you know, institutional investors have guidelines regarding how much exposure they want to have to uh, foreign assets. And if the, uh, if the share markets in the US, as they did, go up, they have to reduce back their exposure and then they're selling assets or foreign exchange or doing the financial uh, equivalent to that so as to reduce their exposure back. So this relationship, which was always very strong, seemed to have sort of vanished for a while uh, during the concern about the judicial overall, but I think it also contributed to the strengthening of the shekel in recent weeks. Thank you. Um, you spoke about um, the government needing to get expenditure under control. You talked about deficit and borrowing, but of course there's another way that the government can improve its fiscal position, and that's by taxing all of us um, and everyone else in the country. What are your thoughts about the appetite and the ability of the Israeli taxpayer to pay more tax? Um, do you think, for instance, a wealth tax might be introduced? Um, generally, I would say that I think that the government, as I said before, will need to bring back the uh, debt or debt to GDP ratio slowly to comfortable levels. Um, I should say that even before the war, the government spending on uh, basic civil services was relatively very modest. If you compare Israel's spending on uh, education, health, uh, welfare, and everything else, relative to GDP, we're among the lowest in, uh, in OECD countries. So I was on the of the view, also in the past, that we need to improve some of these services. I will not go into detail of what spending too little on health and, and education means for the quality of life, but I think it has consequences also for growth, not only for the uh, quality of life. 
And in order to finance that, especially in a country that has high uh, defense needs, you, we needed higher taxes. I think now it's, it would be necessary uh, because we will have, we will see an, an increase in the defense spending. I'm not talking about the immediate uh, one-off need to pay for ammunition and reservists and, and all these needs. I'm talking about a longer term uh, increase in our uh, defense spending. I think there is a clear uh, recognition that we will have to increase the, the size of the army. So we will have to pay for that. Generally, uh, I, I, what my expectation is that we can uh, very gradually uh, get the debt to GDP ratio back to, to where it should be uh, and deal in, the, in, in a gradual way uh, with the additional one-off uh, increase in spending. But we must, uh, if we increase permanently the budget, for that part, for the permanent part, we have to uh, pay for it by uh, increasing uh, resources. And that means basically taxes. And which taxes? You know, there is a, a, a large menu. I'm not sure that wealth tax will be high on the list, not because it's not a just tax. It's just a, very, a tax that is quite complicated to actually um, to actually. Uh, collect a significant amount. Um, I think one of the um, candidates to be increased is a, a income tax, because in, in Israel we collect income tax. Uh, overall, we collect relatively little. And it's not because the uh, marginal tax on the higher brackets is low. It's not low. The, the thing is that about 55% of uh, employees in Israel don't get into the threshold where they pay taxes. Basically, because of all the exemptions, uh, only uh, about three um, deciles, asyronim deciles, yes, yeah, yes. Uh, pay any income tax. I think this is not a reasonable uh, mm -hmm. situation. So I think this is one area. And then there are other all kinds of exemptions, tax exemptions that I think uh, need to be uh, sort of reviewed. Some of them had justification in the past and may not be as justified now. Some of them are quite regressive. Uh, I think, for example, the um, uh, exemptions on of taxations around Pen, saving for pensions are probably too high. We also have a, a compulsory a pension saving. So you don't need to, when you do something compulsory, you don't need to give so much incentives. So I think there are different ways, but it's clear that we will have to uh, increase uh, the tax revenues, at least to pay for the permanent increase in, in spending. Uh, I want to thank everyone very much for coming, um, especially to our, our very special guest, Professor Pook. Um, really has been a, an exceptionally interesting, thought-provoking evening of learning about the outlook for the Israeli economy, how we hope to navigate um, you know, the post-war economic situation. Of course, we're not just worrying about medium-term interest rates, we're worrying about other things as well. The return of the Hatifu, <coughs> the return of our soldiers after victory, yeah. um, the end to the war successfully. And for the Pioneer family, of course, I um, want to welcome back Josh Kurza. <laughs> a member of our investment team, he spent the last mostly three months in Gaza. I don't think he's been doing any stock market research there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, other things. So, of course, we're all going to be back the rest, the rest of the team as well. But thank you very much for joining us. Please stay outside and uh, we'll have a chance to chat then. Thank, thank you very you. much. Thank you. Uh,